this is in the, in the fridge just uh, just happens to saunter in on a special occasion, which happens to be really our first our first anniversary of walk with me, and uh, it's great to have a couple of uh, great guests on board. I, I am gonna I am gonna pump. Fridge's tires up. All jokes aside, never mind that he is he is one of the um, as as Steve Broadstock known, and we've even got Broadie out for walk this morning. Fridge, so you know it must oh, be really? a special occasion. Yeah, <laughs> my God, <laughs> is he on yet? He's there somewhere. The pirate. I think he's. I can definitely but, see him on there. But um, the Jolly Roger. <laughs> but Fridge. Uh, all jokes aside, when I I, I don't think. Um, Believe it or not, and this is quite dangerous to say this, that Fridge actually took me under his wing. And for a brief period, Fridge was actually my manager <laughs> for a little while. But I think more importantly, it was, um, I think I would have been a skinny kid that was just playing in the reserves. And then Fridge said, well, I started doing some training with Fridge, which uh, for those that know Fridge is training. And as Butters would know, it's probably not, it's probably not his favourite forte, but He's the one that gave me a bit. Of, he's the one who gave God, me. This is where you got to stick up for me, brothers. No, no, but he, he actually gave me a kick in the ass and, and got me moving. So I do have Fridge to thank for a lot of things. Most of them, most of them are positive. Not all, not all of them are positive. Um, and then the other one is everyone's. Uh, and then Fridge would attest to this to have. Uh, to have we've had we've had David Butterfin on before. Um, Whenever we get to hear from him, and even Fridge, I know that he wouldn't have spoken to David Butterfield for um, for a long, long time. That as soon as you hear that familiar, uh, familiar voice, Fridge, and, um, and the passion that's in Butterfield, I get nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> you might have nightmares, mate. <laughs> we've all, I know, but, but we've all, I think we've all. I think we might have always said, Butters, if we find out one day that walking in the water at St Kilda is no good for you, you're a dead man. <laughs> oh, I had a hot and cold, I had a cold, and cold shoulder before I come here today, Butters. Oh, good one, mate. Well <laughs> done. Didn't you bring those in? No, uh, hot and cold shoulder. Hot, hot and cold shower. showers. Did you make yeah, yeah. Those? yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, I've got those going. I had Bring one of those this morning Bring for you just to get into the mood. Good with a fridge pot, mate. You can see you got a good habit going still. That's impressive. That's it. Yeah. But, um, That's it. So before I um, end up throwing it open and having a bit of a chat anyway, look, I, yeah, walk with me. Look, started on the back of everyone knows a bit of back history that, you know, in seeing the headline in the Australian newspaper that the, the suicide toll would outstrip the coronavirus toll. Um, and then I don't know when it, when I actually really start to think about it now, it's, um, I don't know, there was a lot of key words that probably came up in terms of what you were trying to do with walk with me over the journey and then what you're trying to sort of do even moving forward. Um, I don't know. I think there were, there were some words like even in being inspired, like having structure, routine, um, learning all these sort of things. But I think the other one that comes to mind that summed up, I think even my attitude around that time and probably just in general, I think it's a, it's a bit of defiance, like to be able to say, well, don't accept where you are. And if you can try and do something about it, um, that was probably a key word that come to me. And for those that know me and you guys have heard me talk at different times that I get particularly angry about the fact that we can have such a reaction to something like coronavirus, but we can't in terms of what's uh, what's the awkward conversation. But all we can do is what we've tried to do over the last 12 months. And uh, Gareth, my mentor that couldn't be on here this morning, a lot of you guys know, um, what do you say? It translated into something like 520 hours of walks and all the preparation. And so there's a few hours when I, when I looked at it, there was a lot of hours that, that went into actually doing it, but I don't know, like at least over the last 12 months and especially during those, uh, 
those times last year, like all jokes aside, like I know that Bridge and I are pretty lucky um, in terms of where we live in Queensland and you can see sun in the back of where Fridge is, I think, down on, uh, down in Cool and Gatter down there, I think. Um, where are you, Fridge? I'm just at uh, Cooley at the moment, walking towards uh, the best beach in the world, Rainbow Bay. Yeah, so uh, when, uh, when in the middle of the pandemic last year and you were trying to lift, uh, lift people's spirits and it is, yeah, like to be able to, to be able to at least contribute and be able to help give people the structure and the routine and uh, that we're able to do was was something. When I look back at the the end of 2020, I, I know this sounds sounds silly. It was like I was I was nearly disappointed that it was o- over. I know that, but it, yes, I wanted all the negative negative stuff, but it was such a positive experience to be able to do something that started on a bit of a whim on the back of you know I mean seeing the headline and then also um being great mates with Wayne Swass and um Wayne Swass and, and Jake Edwards and to be able to do something and all the various guests over the journey. Um before I end up talking to David Butterfin and even uh Fridge again. Um I know there's gonna be look I think it's to everyone who's consistently come on without sort of directly singling out everyone, like to have all the regular crew that make the effort. Um, like, a, I mean, a, a, I wouldn't have been able to keep doing it if you didn't, um, you weren't able to have people that were regularly going to get up and feel like you're actually contributing. So a big thanks to all you guys. Um, the other ones, uh, that spring to mind, like even Brad Hopkins helped us out early days. Um, Stewie Ward um, from National Make Good and all the people that, you know what I mean, were helping out even just, I mean, it wasn't a lot of dollars, but any dollars is, is greatly uh, accepted to be able to do all the videos and all the social media and all the bits and pieces that were able to go with it. But I don't know, like even, even moving forward, um, it's it's quite interesting. I think I'd even said this to you guys. Like I'm now probably getting the position where, yeah, I'm actually earning more money than last year. But I, I nothing, nothing in terms of um, being so rewarding would be the stuff you do with Walk with Me, and then the messages that you get from people about you know, helping help, helping helping people out with whatever they're going through. I think um, yeah, it's something that I'm obviously passionate about and want to keep it all going. But I don't know. Like I, I mean, I'll throw it to uh, David Butterfin. I know that. I know that. Look, even uh, something. How have you noticed Butters in the last uh, twelve months in terms of people's behaviour and what they've been doing and how they've how they've dealt with everything, like post pandemic? Like, what have you noticed? Different yeah. or any any surprises and 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 once again thanks for making the effort because I know everyone you I think you were hot in, in the top top echelon of everyone voted for last year in terms of a, a favourite guest ne- never mind that you were one of mine too. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, before I answer that question, I want to I want to commend you. I think this is one of the things that you've done as a great initiative, and I think what it, what really happens here is giving people hope. Um, and it's momentum, and that's what life is about. It's about momentum moving forward. And how good is it? We're out walking, we're listening to friends and people. It's, it's powerful, and you, and you do get snippets of their life and things you may be able to translate. So, so I would actually commend you on that, mate. I think it's a great initiative. It takes effort, and you're connecting with people. Um, and I really do believe you're giving people hope. And I think when there is, when we are exposed to adversity, I think that's what you need. You need hope in life. Um, and I think that during obviously COVID, uh, it was challenging time for many people, businesses and relationships and health and so forth. Um, they needed to gravitate to something that, that made them help you know, during their day. So really, what I have noticed in some sectors post COVID, or well, really still going, but it's kind of residual fatigue in, in a lot of people I've noticed, um, is I'm firing off an adrenaline 
throughout the end of the year, last year. And now they're kind of feeling it. You know, it and we, we're seeing it on so many people now. But I do I do believe some people have actually turned that adversity into an advantage as well. You know, I really think that some people have leveraged upon that and they've actually built the capacity, which is great to say. You know, that's really inspiring as well. So really good question. I think that's... Um, there's two kind of effects of people who have this residual effect and I think there's other people who have actually really leveraged upon it and embedded some really healthy habits in their life. Um, and I, I think I'm hearing a lot of gratitude as well from a lot of people, um, particularly around relationships, health, um, and not sweat the small things as much as they probably were. So yeah, that's my, that's my kind of simple take on it. But yeah, that's, I think that's what some of the things I'm seeing at the moment. A lot of, Summary of it. Isn't it funny when you mention it, but it's like about hope and off the back of what we're actually even um, like hope in anything, right? But even off the back of what we were we were just talking about with North Melbourne, that all of a sudden all you want some hope, like all you want to do is hang your hang your hat on some like it started with North Melbourne, for example, like oh they, they played well in a half against Melbourne and there's a little bit of hope there. All of a sudden, doesn't it just change the mood just to have oh. that that little bit of hope? 100%. This is in life, man. It doesn't matter how much despair that you have. If you just got that little glimmer of hope, it just keeps that momentum going. And obviously, the opposite of hope is hopelessness, really. And this is the thing where some people feel that. What, what can we do? Just a, get a little bit of hope in them. And just keep that pile of light flickering. And keep that momentum going. Yeah, and North Melbourne is a good example of that. You know, everyone thinks, oh, it's so hopeless, but you've got a little bit of hope and then that can build. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, good point. Geez, the people you see, Corey, when you walk on, just see the ex-wife say hello to Corey McCann. Hi. <laughs> hello. <laughs> I'm just on video. Hi, I'm walking with you. Oh, hi, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll so I'm hard to say mad at, apparently. <laughs> Now, um, the other one I will throw to, and it's probably a bit unannounced, and I'm probably going to catch him with guard. So, Brad, if Brad Hopkins is still there, are you still there, Brad? Yeah, mate. What do you mean? Now, I want to, not only uh, there's you and, uh, you and Stewie Ward. Now, I know that, um, yes, I'm really good mates with the pair of you, but the pair of you... I think we're fantastic with your attitude about how that you went about it. Like when, when all the pandemic happened, what, how did you go about it? Like, cause I know that we always talk about sport and how we go about it from that angle, which um, I can swing back to Mark Roberts and I'll ask him some questions about that. How did you, how did you approach it from a mindset point of view in terms of when all that stuff was happening? Cause it looked, it looked like it was going to be pretty horrible for a, a while, didn't it? Yeah, look, uh, first off, before I go on, um, yeah, Corey, uh, following on from what the guys said, um, fantastic effort that you've, you've done. You've helped uh, and engaged so many people who, you know, during that early days of lockdown needed some, definitely some routine and structure. And um, I know it definitely helped me and motivated me to, to help my team and, uh, you know, try and keep them engaged. And, and as you're saying, look, it looked... Uh, you know, this time last year, or you know, maybe maybe early April, looked uh, looked pretty grim for my industry, especially and, and a lot of others. But um, uh, we just had to refocus and and uh, and find some new ways to just get get through. And obviously, um, uh, we we were locked down for a fair while, but we were still allowed to sell sell cars um, uh, from the internet. So we we did a a uh, put all our cars online and we did a 24-hour uh, refund policy um, for free freight anywhere in Victoria. So uh, and it's just amazing how many people were at home and not much else to do. Well, let, let, let's let's look for a car on the internet. So um, and uh, we, we said if, you, if you're happy with the car, you pay for it in full. Um, we, we'll truck it out to you. If you're not happy with it for any reason, no questions asked, we'll pay for the truck back and refund you for all your dollars. Out of about uh, that three that three month period, uh, that lockdown, there was about uh, I think we sold about two hundred and fifteen cars, and we had one person who wanted to return it. One, one. So, 
So it's just um, and it, the other thing apart from the, the business side of it, not, not, there was only myself, Joe, and Adam, my partners that, that went into work, and all my staff were actually at home. So we, we just did a uh, made sure we touched base with them, you know, a couple of times a week just to see how they're going and making sure they were keeping some sort of routine and not not just playing Xbox or you know uh, watching Netflix and. We end up coming up and, uh, you know, Corey mentioned, you know, as you mentioned to me, that what about getting them to, to have a challenge? And we did the um, uh, we did the walk at, to, to walk or run a 1,000 Ks in six weeks. And I think we smashed it in four and a half with all our staff combined. So, And they were so, they were so wrapped. They were trying to G each other on to get, to get out there and do something, do some physical exercise. And, um, yeah, that just that just kept them going. And... Uh, yeah, no, I really appreciate you, you coming up with that suggestion. It, it really helped my whole team. So thanks very much. That one was, Corey, yeah, that, yeah, go on. Sorry, just letting you know a duck has walked into the room. Oh. G'day, Cause. G'day, g'day everyone. Hello, Ducko. G'day. Hello. I had some children to organise this morning, which I've, uh, <laughs> which I've done. Did you make the lunches? I have done all of that fridge. And packed with love. <laughs> You're a super dad, Doug. Good work, mate. Good, good yeah. work. No, all all done. I, I tell you what, it looks a lot nicer where you are than what it is where I am. Oh, it's sensational up here. 12 degrees, though. A little bit chilly. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> We're spoiled up here. <laughs> it's nearly a tracksuit. It's nearly a tracksuit, though. Yeah. No, it looks absolutely beautiful. No, happy to join. Uh, Doug, how did you... Um... I do know some parts of your routine of what you were doing during lockdown, but how did, like, when you look back on it now, like, um, if that ever happened again, and God forbid, let's hope it never does, what would you do different? Um, to be honest, I, I, I got into it. I, it was it was easy to get into some. It was, it was easy to get into some bad habits. Um, you know, I, I found you know obviously stuck at home. Um, you know, with the kids sort of 24-7 and it was, and the fact that you couldn't see anyone or do anything, you, I, I cooked, I must admit, I cooked the barbie nearly every night, but just got into having a, you know, a glass of red, or, you know, sort of every night while you're cooking dinner. So um, that's one thing that I definitely do differently. Um, now, um, since lockdown's finished, I've, I've got out of that, it's funnily enough, I've got out of that habit and don't do that at all anymore. So... Um, that's one thing that I would change, only because it, it was just, I don't know, just got into this uh, routine and I spoke to a lot of people. Um, I spoke to Hamish McLaughlin and he was saying his wife was, you know, doing the same thing while she was cooking dinner. So, you know, just a lot of people sort of, I, I think, got into, you know, I, I guess that insular feeling of not being able to do anything. So certainly pick up, picked up some bad habits that um, I've been able to, to um to get rid of since we've been out of out of lockdown for sure. Now Butters, while you've got um obviously three of the best trainers at the North Melbourne Football Club over in your journey. <laughs> <laughs> well well actually two of them anyway. Um, <laughs> what's, um, yeah, duck, duck and I. <laughs> you, you've you've probably spoken about this before, but what for the people out there, what what do you think um just give the people into the uh, an insight into what it was like to be in control of us blokes. <laughs> well, yeah, I was never in control, mate. Don't worry. I never had control of you, mate. So get that correct. <laughs> no, it was, it was actually, it was, I got cherished memories of times at Arden Street. I loved it, you know, and it was a wonderful time. Um, I, think, I think what was great was that the, the guys had a fantastic work ethic, you know, like, you know, no one really complained about working, so it's kind of like it made, made the job very, very easy, really. Um, we're talking you know, 25 years ago now, a long time ago, but I mean, really, in a way, the job was easy because the guys were committed to hungry for success. So, really, it was just put it up on that, just it just chewed up. So, it was, it was quite easy to call it. Was, but I, I actually sometimes used to pinch myself, really, when I was there, and I was in a wonderful, wonderful moment, you know. In the early stage of my career, so I've got a lot of cherished memories. But as I must, I must oh. say that uh, um, 
not too many of not too many fitness coaches that uh, I've had over my time, or I think at any footy club, when when you get asked to you know um, do a particular run or finish off some some really hard work, and you're smiling and doing it with you, it makes it a little bit easier. <laughs> when, uh, well, plus it also well, helps the cool-headed, black-headed bloke back in the background who I'd give you a crack <laughs> if you did this. Exactly right. I don't know what I was smiling. I might have been. You know, grimacing under that under that smile, but yeah, I did. I, I must admit, you know, I really enjoyed that element, being able to train with the boys and do stuff like that was really good fun as well. So, so, to, yeah. so to give so to give everyone an idea, and that's this is what Zuck's maybe alluding to. I think it is. So if we if just say Fridge had hurt his knee, well, if Fridge had to go for a bike ride, Butters would go and do the bike ride. If I couldn't do training and I had to do a swim, then Butters would come and do the swim. Yeah. And then maybe for good measure, if there's something else that Duck had to do. So during the course of that day, like he basically <laughs> do every activity with all the players. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I say my food bill was pretty high back then. I should have a few calories. <laughs> okay. well, I just lost my reception for a little bit there. Um, so even, I know me, like all, all jokes aside, so even, Fridge, what were the things, like, I know that everyone can joke about, um, you know I mean, that you, sometimes you might be perceived as having an aversion to doing physical activity, but how would, how would you, because you're all, we're all vastly different the way that we're all wired, like the way that Duck could prepare for a game, the way that I would, how would you, from a mindset point of view, just for everyone out there, because that's what I mean. Everyone's everyone's different, and we try and pick up little gems about from everyone about what you can what you can pick up and get better. But how would you approach approach your footy? I know that you were more laid back, and so what what would you? How would you approach? Um, yeah, the, probably wouldn't say wouldn't say I was actually laid back. I was probably just uh, I was more about uh, preparation. So I was, yeah. which. I used to do a lot of training away from the club, which I'd swim probably three mornings a week. I'd bike ride because of my knee three more, three afternoons a week. Um, and then basically, and if I didn't do it, I didn't feel I was prepared to play. So yeah. no, I, in the end, I, I used to run, I think, three or four extra sessions a week away from the group with uh, the, the runners, Kent, and a couple of others. So I just, uh, it'd only be 20, 25 minutes, but I'd just get to run in the legs. And if I didn't do that, I'd be like, oh, I'd, I'd felt like I was going to the game half naked. So mine was more about that that side of it. So by the time I got the weekend, you know, I was fairly, fairly relaxed. Although the ex-wife standing behind me is just shaking her head, saying that I wasn't actually that relaxed. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But also... <laughs> She's had a, <laughs> but also at around that time, which was probably different to a lot of other blokes, Fred, you were actually still working at the same time. I was, uh, probably because I was towards the end of my career. And to be honest, I probably <laughs> didn't expect to, to last as long as I did. So I sort of, uh, I just kept working and working. Oh, I'm fine. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just... Uh, I kept going for probably four or five years longer than I thought I, I would. So uh, that's why I kept working. And this is probably a question for Butters and um, Fridge. Like, do you think players nowadays, we could end up going a little bit back to the future where they need to be doing more stuff outside of football? Because it just seems when you're in that bubble of 24-7 of, of playing football, I know that the clubs love to talk a good game about looking after their sort of headspace and mental health. But do you think we could get to a time where they might go back to the future a little bit? And I mean, even would we start pre season um, that we trust players? Like, no, no longer, unfortunately, players are banned are going on footy trips anymore, which is a disgrace anyway. That's a different story. And that would have hurt three blokes, three blokes on this uh, video link up. <laughs> but do, you, do you think, Butters, uh, it might be a case eventually 
the first teams that do it might be seen as a bit groundbreaking, even though from a, you think we're trying to peak for a sport that yeah. is so far in the distance. And yet we seem to, I mean, a lot of teams starting training October, November, and we're trying to peak for an event that's nearly a year away. Totally, I totally oh, agree. I'll go, I'll, you go, Rich. I'll go, buddy. You, I was going to jump in and say, when we first, when I first come to North and Duck was there then, we we didn't train before Christmas. So you had to actually do your own work. And then you'd get to uh, December the 1st and have a time trial. And if you didn't pass the time trial, you'd go back and uh, you'd start your training. If you passed it and they were happy with you, they saw you after January. And that was uh, that was interesting. That was the only, only time I ever had never done anything before Christmas. But I... The quintessentially the problem you're going to have is the coaches because they, they love the control of having you there all the time. But there's only so, so much uh, training you can do. There's only so many meetings you can have before it becomes overkill. Yeah. And so I don't know what the happy medium is, but they've got surely they've got too much time on their, their hands and it, that's where all the issues come in. I don't know how you're going to rectify that because I don't think you try and tell an 18-year-old kid now that's getting paid four or five hundred grand that he's, he's got to go home work. I don't, I don't know how you're going to do that. Well, that that's that's a good point. your thoughts, Butters? Well, I really subscribe to that fear. I think first, first and foremost, I think pretty much a person first, athlete second. So it's very holistic. So I think they've got to have the skills to engage in community, work, family, relationships. I think that's very, very important. And I think we want hearing what Bridge was saying, there's so many coaches now, they all want to pay to the players. So just, they have an agenda, and it's not their fault, but they to justify the position, more is better, but it's not. You know, this is it's all that quality. It's having that time to do things outside of football that's going to give them balance. And balance is what the most important thing is. And they come in the training, really wanting to train and engage. I, I think that's... I think that's an easy formula to actually implement. Is it okay? You've got to have, you've got to cultivate and nurture the things that are very important, not just in footy, but in life. Relationships, work, community, volunteer, whatever it may be, study, education. These things are crucial. And I think if players do that, they'll transition out of football a lot, a lot easier. And I think this is a problem that's a part of. So many players have different in transitioning outside of football. So really what we're just saying, yeah, it's spot on. I think it's a club that's got the courage to do it, and it comes down to what? Trust. You've got to trust them that they're gonna they gonna commit themselves to off season, they're gonna train and meet the criteria. If they do that, you get a buy in. It comes down, it comes down to trust. Yeah, I think I think it's the way to, I personally I think it's the way to go. So that, that, um, is there a reason why so many players struggle with transition out of football, but it's because they've had well, their it's... whole world catered for them. They don't work. Yes. Everything's yes. a false economy in many respects. And then they come out of football, it's all over. And in yeah. many respects, without being, disre- being rude, you're just a number. And the then yeah. they've got to try and, try and assimilate into society, which it doesn't, just doesn't work. T- totally, totally. It's so foreign. I think that's, that's the thing is we see so many players transition out of footy with so much difficulty. Um, and and we see players with a lot of dysfunction. But you're right, it's getting those skills and life skills sorted as a young young person coming into football, giving them the, the, the life skills to set them up post-football. Like the average player plays something like 12 games. The average player. So I think it's four years. So really in a way, let's set them up. Football doesn't define who you are. It's one element, yeah, it's great. Um, so it's really kind of using it as a vehicle to set yourself up in life. Pick out, pick out the traits of discipline, being team orientated, um, work ethic. You know, those things are really important that you can translate into a everyday life. Yeah, I'm with you, I'm with you, Fridge, I reckon. I think clubs need to have a bit of courage here, go down that path, and I reckon you'll notice a shift in players' ability. And I think you find a lot of players that really love it. Once they've been in the system for eight, nine years, are they really enjoying it or are they, it's a bit of a grind for them? 
guess a duck uh, like early days when you first finished playing that, you know what I mean, you probably struggled with a bit of you know, having the, not having the structure and the routine? Yeah, look, I, I think exactly what the, what the boys are saying there is exactly right. I think, you, you know, you, you, you do, you have everything everything done for you, you have a, and then you, you get a player manager and they do everything else for you, they pay your bills. Um, they do absolutely, you have everything done for you, and, and that's from the age of 16. So, so you really haven't um, learned any of those skills that, that uh, Butters and Fridge were talking about. So I can concur with, with everything they said and certainly still think it's the, the biggest, one of the biggest problems that, sports people have coming out of it and, and to be honest they don't and like to back up what Fridge said they don't even start thinking about life after footy until probably they're in their last year and then and then it's too late um, you know the, the planning for that transition has to start a lot earlier than that yeah. Yeah. and Doc I, I spoke to yeah. I spoke I spoke to Herdy the other week and it's interesting like I mean the pair of you, I mean, at different times where you had a little bit of a struggle, was that even? Is that probably one of the biggest things as you alluded to about not having the structure and the routine is one of the biggest things that feels like it nearly sort of brings you undone a little bit. Absolutely, I, and and I think that's one of the great things that football gives you. And, and once again, to back up what Butter says, as I just introduced you to Carter quickly, is going to be hello. <laughs> That's little Carter. Um, yeah. To, so the, the one thing that football, the one thing that football does give you is, um, you know, it does give you that structure, and it does, and it does teach you those valuable lessons that Butters talked about before. So, if you think about it in those terms, it, it, it really does give you a lot of things that that can can help you transition into to work life outside of footy. Unfortunately, um, to back up what Fridge said, is when you're paying guys, and, and you know we're all part of that, we're paying guys really good money, pretty hard to say go out and, and start looking at that transition or, or what you're going to do after footy while you're getting paid that sort of money. And, and, and in a lot of in a lot of ways, a lot of the study that players do, um, and a lot of the courses they take, it's a lot of it is a, a token effort because they're told sort of to do it. They don't really take it seriously, because unfortunately, when you're a when when and, and you guys know this, and Butters obviously does as well, is when you've 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 excelled to a certain degree to become an AFL footballer or, or any sport for that matter. So there's there's a certain uh, there's a certain state of mind or, or or the way you think about uh, going about things, and you think that you're going to play for 15 years and. And as, as Butter said, very few play for 10 or 15 years. Um, and like you said, the average, the average game. Just, I think it's gone up a little bit now, Butters. I think it's in the 20s. Um, oh, but, it's, but that's not a lot, is it? I mean, you know, that's, that's the average. Only, only 4% of players, it's up to 5% now, play 200 games. So, so, yeah, so 5% five, so 5 of players that play our game you could argue could set themselves up for the rest of their lives now. Five percent. That's not a lot. Yeah. Well, the other the other thing is too. When do you tell a player, say five years out, to transition for your retirement? When do you know that time is up? Because you could go on for ten, fifteen, or you could go on for five. Depends on your injuries. So yeah, exactly that, right. that's the other problem you've got. And if I'm twenty five, I don't want to be, and I'm sure Duck and uh, Corey are in the same boat. You don't want someone coming to you and saying, "Listen, you got to think about your retirement in five years." You think, think you're probably going to go past that. The other thing is not 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 all players go through the, you know players go through form slumps and all sorts of things. So if they are starting to plan for life after footy and they're doing some study or they're doing some uh, work, even if it's charity work, if their form slightly drops off, what the first thing that the first thing that they drop. Are those things for after footy? They yeah. put more focus into their footy clearly because they want their form yeah. to go. So yeah. the first thing that gets dropped off is the planning for after. Hence, hence why I think players really struggle to, to back up what you guys were saying. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, you know, 
and just quickly, boys, we've only got about five minutes to go. It's been awesome to get you all along. We've actually got someone else who was brilliant with his uh, structure and routine, and you talk about someone who had to have a little bit of hope, was uh, joined by more North Melbourne royalty in Jason McCartney, or now the GWS footy manager. We might have to all chip in, though, because... Uh, has he got a little bit of a fine hang hanging over his head or not? <laughs> <laughs> Morning all. Uh, the invoice for the mail, Corey. How are you? <laughs> Just How's a quick guys? one. Very good, Jace. Just a quick one in the short time we got left. I know that you might have heard the back end. Um, you might have heard the back end of this uh, discussion of what we're talking about, of what... Um, yeah, like you're obviously the. I mean, being the footy manager at GWS, what what's the club doing in terms of looking after um, the players' welfare nowadays compared to what you've seen happen over the last few years? Yeah, look, it's obviously far greater than there was anything in our day, and there's designated people assigned to that area within the footy club. So uh, the AFL through the AFLPA do some do some really good programs for the draftees initially. Um, over the first 12 months to set them up like an apprenticeship scheme and expose them to a, a few different areas of life skills and business planning and financial planning. The, the boys had a session yesterday uh, with a property development guy up here in Sydney. So it's exposing them to a few different things, but then really encouraging um, the players, obviously, to um, tap into their university studies. There's obviously the allocation of time is a lot better too. It's much more structured. So... Um, the boys do have more time uh, assigned, like in, in a normal week for us, so a Saturday to Saturday game, which rarely happens. But in that situation, like, for example, a Monday afternoon is a dedicated uh, CBA block for study. And then normally what would be a, what would it be, a, when, a Thursday would be a player's day off. So there's opportunities that we encourage. I think all by a couple of our boys are studying in some capacity. Um, but there's also, for some of the more senior guys, opportunities around uh, some work placement a day a week to, to, to help with that transition. So, yeah, there's a, lot, there's a sharper focus, that's for sure. And there's, I suppose, better support around it in comparison to what there once was. Now, in the time we've got left, we've got about four minutes left, and then I'm, I'm trying to wrap it up with, been, again, a big... Thank you to everyone who's been on over the journey, like the regulars and everyone like that. I mean, I'm trying to condense all this, but if I said to all you guys and Jason, if you want to go first, what would be the one thing uh, that you would do now if you were playing footy again, that where you'd where you'd look after your own mental mental space when you're playing football? What would be one thing you would do different? Because there might be an idea that someone can learn from in their own lives or whatever. So it gives Bridge and David Butterfin and Duck a bit of notice. But what would be one thing that you would do different if you had your time over again that would just give you that bit of hit the reset button? Oh, there's no doubt. We've got a guy we use at the club who's outstanding. He runs a retreat up in Byron Bay and it's it's just the meditation piece. I've only tapped into it a little bit, but yeah. um, it's just amazing for that. Yeah, just to the rigors and everything going on. Everyone's got busy lives, so much going on. And just to, to take that time out and invest, you just never invest enough time in yourself, I find. You, you're just rushing around, trying to do everything else for every, everyone. And you just got to take some time out and invest in yourself. Yep, very good answer. I'm a big, everyone knows I'm a big believer of meditation. What about you, Duck? Probably I'll, I'll, I'll be, probably grow up, Corey, for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, look, look. There's there's a lot of things. I, I think certainly putting more focus the, the discussion that you've had this morning, and this isn't, and you know, this isn't just for for AFL football. This is for, for you know anyone, I guess, in a restricted industry that only lasts for a certain amount of time, and and knowing that you have to transition. But I think putting more time into that um, would certainly be one of my main focuses, um, and and you know, like I've. I've got a young, I've got a young family now, and I'm an old man. Maybe I should have started a family a little bit earlier, but <laughs> <laughs> um, you're a young fella, like a bit of me. I've got to keep, I've got to keep up with a, a, a two and a six and a, a nine and a fifteen year old. So, um, 
got to keep, still got to keep reasonably fit. But no, that, that, those things, Corey, I think, you know, the things that you discussed this morning, I think, uh, you know, really important. Uh, what about you, Fridge? Fridge is gone. Uh, no, we've lost him. That's all. Um, all right. Well, we'll probably finish with the great man himself. Um, <laughs> How about that? What, what, uh, what would be your when you actually when you've seen from the outside of uh, because you've been in control a lot of the footballs. What uh, Bridges back. What would what would you do or what would you suggest different now that you've in your your years of experience of being at Collingwood and uh, the Kangaroos? What what would be the one thing where you go? You know what? That would make an enormous difference to the players' well-being. Well, I do. I'm not. I'm a heavy believer in, in meditation, Bob, because I do think that's very important. Duck touch. So look, you got to look after yourself. I think there's opportunity that we need all of us, whether in sport or not, is having time to self-reflect and um, and asking whether you journal or just asking questions of it. And the three questions I would, you know, I would strongly recommend: is what do you need to keep doing well? What do you need to stop doing? And what do you need to start doing? Just through our self-reflection, what happens is we improve our self-awareness. But as a result, we, we can actually find that better version of ourselves if we ask those tough questions to ourselves regularly. So I think to, ask, to answer your question, it is self-reflection. Um, but we, to get that, we need stillness in the day. We need like some it. time in the day. We need some stillness that we can actually capture ourselves and they're really be great for what things are going well. But keep, stop, start. If everyone's listening, they're the questions I would ask myself. What are you doing that you need to keep doing, that you're doing well? What do you need to stop doing? Uh, that could be bad habits. And what do you need to start doing? Asking those questions, with a journal asking those questions, I think that's really important to build your own self-awareness uh, and build that better version of yourself. So that, that's what I, my take would be. Like it, And Fridge, I'll let you finish on what would you do different that would make a difference to your headspace plane? Oh, I probably would have taken more um, early on, especially before I got to North Melbourne. I probably uh, didn't look after myself that well. Probably partied too much. and uh, So I probably uh, didn't look after myself at all. So that would probably be the, the biggest thing that I would change. Yeah. Well, look, everyone... Which then um, help, help your mindset. It's, uh, look, on behalf of uh, everyone, to be able to um, get on with you boys and have a chat like this, I think it's a fantastic forum. Sorry, everyone, we didn't get time for questions. But um, look, once again, I'm looking at the names on the list. They're all the regulars. Um, Duck Reeben, even Elpy, we must have done something special because even Elpy's joined on today as well. So oh, that's great, great, to, great to hear. I, I follow Elpy on uh on uh, his, his uh, media platforms and he looks like he's uh, fit and healthy and happy and doing really well. So good to hear that he's on here. Very good. So look, a big thanks everyone. It, it is a great first birthday. It's been fantastic for me to do. Um, and then look, even having mornings like this morning, not only with the regulars, but uh, the guys that um, I did a lot of great things with. So on behalf of everyone, guys, um, yeah, big thanks. And, have a great day, everyone. It's been fantastic. Hey, uh, boy, thanks, thanks for everything you've done, Corey. Corey. Happy Much birthday, Corey. Corey. Fantastic. Yes, thank, thank you. Guys. Guys. Hey. Thank, thank you. Corey. Thanks for the message. Bye. Thanks, boys. Bye. Take care. Bye, Corey.